guitar enthusiasts of every stripe and description, it's Steve, the OG Guitar Nut, and welcome to episode 33, I believe, 33, of Guitar Nuts Anonymous. This is going to be our first actual workbench video, as opposed to our last, which was a semi-workbench video. But before we get to that, let's talk about some uh, current events and things that are going on and uh, guitar stuff in general. Um, I, as I understand it, um, our first ever giveaway uh, uh, is now over. Uh, the winner chose the uh, Behringer Super Fuzz, which will now be in his possession. So that was cool. Um, I hope to have another giveaway at some other milestone. But speaking of milestones, I just checked and we're sitting at 892 subscribers. Um, Somehow things have kind of really picked up a bit, and not quite viral, but uh, nothing to sneeze at. Nearly 900 of you out there watching. Um, very cool. A lot of you are very opinionated and have things to say. Um, probably people that aren't subscribers more than people that are, but uh, that's neither here nor there. A um, lot of uh, interesting comments made uh, about various episodes, but... Mostly about the Chibson episodes, um, not surprisingly. Some very strong uh, opinions. Apparently I'm a complete nut or dick, um, which if you already knew me, you knew that, but just in case. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm undermining, uh, you know, the economy by the fact that I own and, you know, gave my endorsement, so to speak, to a Chibson guitar. You know, the world's ending. Fair enough. Um, you know, there's so much else going on in the world that obviously isn't nearly as important. But, uh, yeah, uh, some of the comments have been especially interesting, like someone going to great lengths to ask how in the world I could possibly know that the uh, headstock join on the orange chips in Les Paul was a scarf joint. How could I possibly know that if I can't see through the paint? I thought it was rather obvious that it was a see-through orange finish. Um, I think I even held it up to the camera so you could see the joint. You can see the wood grain right through the finish. It's not a solid color. Um, maybe, you know, watch on something bigger than your phone before you comment. I don't know. And then somebody else saying, oh, yeah, yeah, somebody sent him that guitar, and he's setting it up to his specs before shipping it on. No. My anonymous friend from England ordered it and had it sent to me as a gift to the show. He's never going to see the guitar in person himself. He doesn't intend to. He wanted to see my thoughts on it before he ordered one for himself, which at this point I think he may. Uh, we haven't spoken recently, but uh, uh, thank you. You know who you are. Um, yeah, it was a gift to the show, um, and of course I set it up to my liking. Um, the other comment was, if it plays so well, why has he got to set it up? Um, because it was set up with like 9-gauge strings, really low action, which to a lot of people is awesome. The fact that it's possible that it could be set up that way is awesome. You know, that's a hallmark of cheap guitars is the fact that they used often, used to at least, use heavy strings and high action to cover up the shortcomings inherent with bad fret work and whatnot. That guitar played great, but I can't handle nines. I'll bend them out of tune. I tend to go with a 10 gauge hybrid set, which is 10 on the high end to 52 on the low end, because I'm kind of ham handed. I bang on the guitar and I actually like my action quite a bit higher than a lot of people. Now, not like Jay Mascus high. I don't want to be able to stick my hand underneath the strings or anything, but I like to be able to bend, for instance, my G string underneath the D string. Uh, that's the way I learned from, you know, uh, picking it up from, from Arlen Roth articles in Guitar Player Magazine back in the 80s. You know, he mentioned that you should be able to do that. You don't want crazy low action unless you're going to shred and not really worry about bending strings properly. But regardless, naysayers can naysay. Haters going to hate, right, as they say? The kids still say that. I don't know. I haven't been a kid in a long damn time. Um, what else would I talk about? Uh, let's see. Oh, speaking of people in, in England, 
my good friend, Gavin Meaden in London. Hi, Gavin. I assume you're going to watch this. Uh, last year, got a hold of me and said, uh, hey, or maybe it was early this year. I don't know. I'm terrible with time. You know that. I'm lucky I remembered Gavin's name. Um, got a hold of me. He's from London and said, hey, uh, a buddy of mine uh, has a, uh, a band of sorts. He uh, moved away from England to New Zealand and uh, they apparently were collaborating on some music, you know, via the interwebs, which is possible now. And uh, they both had wondered if I would be willing to lend my guitar playing skills, uh, limited as they are, uh, to play uh, some solo parts for one of the songs uh, that they were recording. It was a song called She's a Mod. I was, you know, flattered, more than happy to do it. I, I gave it my best shot. And uh, they wound up liking it and using it. I should mention uh, the other gentleman that I'm speaking of from New Zealand. His name is Ian Haler. And uh, let's see, this was recorded in Auckland, New Zealand. The project is called The Pleasures of June, and the album is called Leave It All Behind You. Here it is. Uh, I'm going to put a link uh, down below to all this. Uh, and, I, and I said, uh, Gavin plays bass on most of it. Ian plays guitars, vocals, drums, bass. Piano, harmonica, and keyboards. Uh, he's a multi-talented guy, a regular Lenny Kravitz of sorts, or Prince, or insert name of other multi-talented guy, you know. But uh, yeah, uh, I'm on here, credited lead guitar and she's a mod, which, uh, you know, is very flattering to be asked, and I never realized it was going to come out on a physical album CD, so to speak, so very cool. And uh, top-notch music. If you're into any kind of 60s, 70s, Rock, glam, power pop, post punk, all these influences are in here. Um, Pleasures of June, great album. Leave it all behind you. So, shout out there. So, what else? Uh, I haven't kept up a whole lot as to what's going on in the world of guitars because not a whole lot of new stuff was released since I spoke to you last, at least that I've seen. Um, and if I'm honest, I've been spending a whole lot more time messing around with my electronic gadgets than I have with guitars. Um, I've spent more time working on a couple of guitars for my dear friend Jonathan Pushkar than I have actually playing them, apart from the Halloween gig that Raygun had, which was a lot of fun. Um, in fact, I'll include a picture of the band in our full Halloween regalia right here. Um, very fun gig at a place called Franz Lounge. Um, yeah, neat little place. Uh, classic uh, Nashville dive bar. Had a great time. Played with a lot of other uh, interesting bands. It was everybody's, you know, stab at the old Halloween thing. And uh, we had a great time. And uh, we'll be back there again. Oh, what else? Um, well, you know, I'm just going to jump right into it. What we have here is my workbench. You guys might recognize, those of you that have been here from the beginning, back when we were Rick and Back Anonymous, might recognize this backdrop. I used to do all of my videos in this room, and I had guitars and amps all lined up all along. Well, my wife's keyboard amps are still in here, and there's still a couple of guitars and things in here, because this is my guitar workbench. And in a few moments here, I'm going to be readjusting uh, this camera situation so you can actually see the top of the workbench as I work. So you won't be seeing my gorgeous face for the rest of the show. Oh, what a nightmare. Um, what I'm going to be doing is installing this single string relapse B bender kit from CB Giddy Crafter Supply. <clears throat> and this is going to be going on this, uh, technically it's a Squire Telecaster, but I've modified it to be basically an Esquire. Single pickup, um, no switch, volume here, tone here. Um, yeah, it's a uh, Something I really like. I think I have a whopping total of, uh, oh gosh, maybe $50 in this guitar. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to put the B bender on here. And uh, I, I, I'm not sure how long this is going to take. This is supposed to be, you know, a very quick installation. But uh, I'm not the handiest of, of handy guys when it comes to some things. Setting up guitars? Got it. Um, Polishing frets and, and, and adjusting truss rods and all that all day long. Installing something for the first time? Who knows? We'll find out. So I may wind up, <coughs> excuse me, I may wind up fast forwarding through some parts rather than 
leave you bored to tears. Guess it'll all come down to how long this whole process takes. Well, let's take a look at what's included in the bag before we get started. Uh, we have, oh, this is all made in USA, which is nice to know. We're a small family business. It's easy for you to say. We're a small family business, and every customer is greatly appreciated. Your bender kit is made with the finest materials, stainless steel, all USA made. Get bent. That's a great slogan. Some uh, installation instructions, which seem pretty reasonably simple. Eight steps. A little diagram here of what the thing should look like. And this over here, this is kind of a... Um, a flyer of sorts. Thank you for the purchase of your Relapse B Bender. Buyer assumes any risk to instrument. So if you put this on your 55 Telecaster and ruin it, it's on you and you're an idiot. Um, but you know, whatever. Um, let's take a look at what I've got in here in this bag. There's not a lot to it. It's a pretty simple design. It's, it's very mechanical. Looks like we have A very long Allen wrench. What I'm assuming, yes, this must be our actual activator. This is our bar. And then uh, we've got a very small Allen wrench, or key as some people call them, which I'm trying very hard to lose. There it is. The replacement bridge saddle will replace the existing one on the guitar. A big ass screw. I think that's the technical term for a screw like this. It's a machine screw uh, with an accompanying nut, which you can't really see, and then a small lever. So, without any further ado, let me adjust the camera, get it where you can see everything, and we'll get started and see how this thing uh, pans out. And with any luck, at the end of this whole process, I'll be able to play you a couple of B bender licks. Um, and you can see how it went. And if this is boring as hell to you, then clock off and go watch one of my chips and videos and tell me what a dick I am. Um, I can take it. Um, other than that, yeah. So let's go ahead. Uh, I'm going to shut this off and I'll come back and uh, we'll get started. So I'm back. Uh, this is the only time you're going to see my face for a bit. You will hear my voice, obviously. And you'll see my lovely hands with my criminally bit fingernails. It's a nervous habit. It's a nasty habit. Someday, maybe I'll get past it. I wouldn't count on it, though. Um, and I do indeed have a spare B string here ready. I, I guess theoretically I could use the existing B string over since these are new strings, but uh, I can afford a new string, and I don't feel like dealing with the... I just want to be able to cut this thing off and be done with it. I will take off the tension first, of course. So, I should mention this, I had to go through six B-strings in my stash to find one that wasn't corroded. You might think that buying guitar strings in bulk is a great way to save money, and theoretically it is, but if you don't use them soon enough, it can actually corrode in the packaging. And I don't just mean in these paper sleeves, even in the plastic Mylar, or whatever other kind of supposedly sealed packages, I was pulling out strings that had big black sections on them that were rough to the touch. You couldn't even polish it off. So apparently I didn't save any money by buying all those strings from the uh, Groon sidewalk sale uh, the year before last. Huh? Somebody loved me. So, uh... Yeah, just a word of the wise, uh, there is something to be said for fresh strings. Um, yeah, I, I would never have thought, but uh, neither here nor there. You get my handy dandy money bag. I've been using the same bag for tools for my guitars for, wow, it's a sobering thought. It's been over 20 years I've been using the same bag. DeMott State Bank, DeMott, Indiana. No idea how I even got this. Um, let's go ahead and cut this B string off. I'll go to about the 12th fret so that uh, I have even lengths of string here so I can tie them together and throw them in the trash responsibly, not get anybody poked. Um, 
come over here, making this more, way more complicated than it needs to be. Welcome into my life. Okay, we'll get this B string out of here. While well, we're here, let's check and see who we're talking to. Ah, memo from the band manager. I'll read that later. All right, so instructions say remove the string and saddle from your desired bender location. All right, so I also need to remove the saddle. This looks to be a pretty standard Phillips head screw. No surprises there. Let's go ahead and remove the saddle. And when I put the next one on, I can say that I'm back in the saddle again. I won't, but I can. I wonder. I won't need to reuse this spring either. The new saddle comes with a spring. So, go ahead and uh, screw this back in so it doesn't get lost. Because who knows when I may have a need for a bridge saddle. In fact, I think I have an old Strat uh, copy that needs a bridge saddle very similar to this. So, Good on me. All right, so <clears throat> remove the string. Okay, align the bender bracket, the short bent piece, over the bridge and facing the neck so that the two smallest holes are behind the bridge. Um, oh, and they line up with these two holes right here. Okay, I'll buy that. Um, insert the new saddle screw through the upper larger hole in the bracket, then through the bridge, the saddle spring, and thread the screw into the new roller saddle, just with a screwdriver. Interesting. So, if I understand correctly, you want me to remove this screw from the saddle. It seems that my hands are shaky. Don't be concerned. Started when I was about 49 and doesn't seem to be getting any better. Um, so, through this and through that, and I put the spring on, which you can't see, you just have to take my word for it. And then the saddle itself. is not going to be the easiest of, uh, of all operations ever, but uh, okay, so all that's like that. Let's see if I can catch, catch the hole here. You have a call from Rob Schneider telling me I can do it. Hey, I got it. How about that? Okay, and I would mention, uh, take a look at the new roller, or the new saddle it has a roller on it. Set this brass roller right here. I guess that's uh, so that a string can move freely and not bind when it uh, is being pulled. Kind of cool. Looks like they thought of everything. Okay. Adjust the number one screwdriver, which I have. Let me go ahead and get it into what looks like something resembling an intonated position. Um, I'll also have to adjust these grub screws because they're quite high uh, out of the thing and it's standing way too proud so the action on the b-string would be incredibly low which we don't want. Let's see. Install the string through the lower smallest hole in the bracket through the bridge and up through the roller saddle. Something tells me that's going to be challenging. Let's see. So we've got a small hole which goes through another small hole and then has to come up through the saddle. So I'm going to pre-bend this a little bit. Let's get a look here. Okay. In the future, when I can uh, afford to do so and figure out how, I'm going to get an overhead camera and an overhead camera mount so you can look down on this. And it'll be just like Dave's World of Fun stuff, if you've ever seen that. So <clears throat> I did it. Uh, it's it's through as suggested. Very cool. All right, so I assume it wants me to attach it through the bridge and up through the roller saddle. Install the string into tuner and adjust pitch. Now before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and, as I mentioned, adjust these grub screws on this saddle so that they make sense for the 
height and uh, radius. This is a very flat radius, so it doesn't need a lot, but let's see here. Eyeballing this, which uh, honestly, I eyeball, I tend to eyeball most things. Um, I'm also a amateur gourmet cook, and I seldom measure anything. Same situation, I eyeball it. I can all eyeball a hank like nobody. All right, that doesn't look bad. So install the string. Okay, let me get down here at the business end and do just that. I may or may not fast forward through this depending on how quickly I get it done because I don't want to bore you to tears. But then again, you know, I might say something witty and gosh, you'd hate to miss that, wouldn't you? All right, through the hole, you got soul. All right, great. Tighten her up. The way I would mention Maybe sometime I'll show how I install strings. I have a particular method that I've been using for the better part of 30 years. I don't really remember where I learned it, no doubt from some Guitar Player Magazine article. Because certainly no person ever showed me. Should the string is on the saddle, which it is. Um, I guess the main thing I want to point out here is that when I trim my strings, this is assuming it's a, a tuner that doesn't have the through hole on the top, which these don't, of course. I always make sure that I bend the little bit of extra string down so that you're not going to accidentally get poked if you go to wipe the headstock or do something. A lot of people leave their string ends sticking up, and uh, there are a few things more painful. And I, I know this from much, much experience. Much more painful than a puncture wound on a fingertip with a guitar string. It, uh, it could literally be a kind of torture. So cut that and then bend that end down so it can't hurt anyone. Anyone meaning me. Do I have a pick handy? Oh, I'm here in the handy dandy pick holder. So I need not be particular. Oh, when did I get that? I don't ever remember having that. This is a Diodario pick with the Wilco logo on it. I should probably put that in my guitar pick collection rather than using it. To be honest, I didn't know I had one. All right, so. Close to being in tune. I do have my handy dandy Peterson Virtual Strobe Tuner here that I'll tune everything up with later. But for now, we're close to one tune. So, step six of eight. We're really moving along here. Adjust the saddle height necessary if included with hex key, uh, with included hex key. Okay, well, guess what? I just did that. Saddle should be parallel to base plate, which, yeah, basically. Okay, thread the lock nut onto the pivot set screw. Really? Okay. Then the friction washer, rubber contacting bender level. Okay, let me, let me read that again. Thread the lock nut onto the pivot set screw. Then the friction washer Why do I not see a friction washer? Am I missing something? Get a handle on what's going on here. And then the friction washer, rubber contacting bender level. Then the bender lever, lever and into the bender bracket. Take a look at the diagram here. Okay, so this guy, that goes uh, with the threads facing up. Okay, sure. Want to go that way? I thought screws were intended to not do that. Well, I guess it will. Okay, 
So like so. Pivot set screw and flange nut. I don't see any rubber anything. And interestingly enough, I don't see any rubber anything on the diagram either. Well, for now, we're just going to plow ahead forward blindly. So apparently what we want to do Is that hmm okay sure oh this actually threads into well no that's not threaded but this appears to be this appears to be threaded okay because I was thinking this had to attach from underneath with the nut like most things would but no that's actually threaded okay I'll buy that um Wow, this thing really stands high and proud off of here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, whoa. And then the nut keeps it stable. Ah, okay. Let me get a close up here so you can kind of see what's happening, hopefully. Go left-handed since I'm very close to the wall. Uh, hopefully you can see here the actual saddle is being pulled back. Very nifty. So, I'm missing anything else. Finger tighten the pivot set screw until it is contacting the top of the saddle. Hmm. Loosen that nut. I wonder. No, it's already going on top. I wonder if maybe it'd be better if it went underneath so it wouldn't be so darn high, but now it wants it to go all the way like that. I don't think it's going to make contact with the saddle. I guess it doesn't need to. Hmm. Okay. Finger tighten the pivot screw until it's contacting the top of the cell. Then back it off slowly and apply the bender and check pitch. When the proper pitch is achieved, tighten the lock nut against the friction washer with the wrench while holding the screw in position number three with a screwdriver. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Gotcha. Looks like O'Neaters. You know that reference? Comment below. All right, so what I'm in need of here, I've got my screwdriver. Also going, mentioning a wrench. Don't have wrenches nearby, but I do have some pliers of sorts. I think I could have these things laid out, wouldn't you? Ah, there we go. That looks like it would hold. So I need three hands, one to hold this, one to hold this, and then one to tighten this with this big Allen wrench. But first, I have to adjust this so that I get the right amount of travel to get to our note. I want this to bend up a whole step. So. I want it to come up to here. It's going to have to come up a lot more than that. So let's see. Push it down. Almost. Back it out a little more. It's just a minute amount. 
course, I also can, you know, adjust my hand pressure on the thing so that I, it's not exact. Pretty close, eh? Cool. All right, so that is set. Now I don't move the screw, but I do move the nut so that it is locking against wonder. Oh, of course not. That'd be too easy. Um, actually, hang on. Before I jump to any rash conclusions, do I have a socket? What size does this need to be? Seven sixteenths. Okay, five six seven sixteenths. What do you know? So theoretically, I should be able to hold this and twist this by hand. Tighten it. Let's see. Okay, it's a little little sharp. So I can back it off a little bit. Or actually screw it in a little bit. Let's see. Just, just a little tiny bit. A little bit more. Now it's a little too much. Bored you, to, uh, bored you to tears yet? I'm guessing I probably have. Um, let's see, it needs to be a little sharper, so it needs to come out a little bit. Okay, let's see. Too much. This is very, very touchy thing here. Touchy feely. Touchy feel thing. One of the songs on my album. Let's see. Off a little bit. Um, actually, it's sharp, so I want it to go down a little bit. Okay. Okay, that's about. Here's a question. This is moving laterally, it's going to change the amount. amount of bend. I guess I need to just tighten that screw. Well no, if I tighten that screw it's going to move the saddle back. Hmm. Well, I guess it's going to be an imperfect system, whatever I do. Um, which is fine. Okay. Bored to tears. Okay, I'd say that's about close. And that's tight. But yeah, if I adjust this screw, all I'd be doing is moving the saddle. So I'm going to have to check the intonation. I'll leave this socket out. I'll probably need it again. Let's see here. I'll tell you what we'll do. Everything's installed. That's tight. Um, let's tune this thing very quickly here. And we'll be able to say whether or not this is a success. And we'll also get this saddle intonated properly. Let's see. I did have a pick, did I not? I'll grab another. Okay, so.
Possible. All right, we're in tune. So, what else we need to do here? I guess I will step out of frame. Oops, and grab one of the coolest purchases I've made in a long time. This is a Boss Katana Mini battery powered amp and um, yeah I really love this Lorcan thing that I reviewed before very, very good sound but I have to say <clears throat> excuse me this boss Katana mini has literally the best overdriven tone I've ever heard from a practice amp certainly one made of plastic and running on batteries by far the best battery powered amp ever and I got this crazy cheap from a pawn shop. Um, 20 bucks. Now, they, normally they're about $120 to buy one new. And I've still no idea why this one was so cheap. But uh, when you come into a deal like that, you don't ask why. You just be happy for your good fortune and get on with your life. All right. So, let's plug this thing in. Why do I have two cables? Oh, never mind. Oops. All right. Let's find out what we got going on here. And let me, in real time, readjust the attitude and altitude of this mount. And we're up and back. We're right on track. All right, and now I'm back in the frame. And I'm back in the room. Okay, so, let's see here. That definitely seems like, well, there, there really is no way to make that tighter against there. It's just not, it is what it is. So, let's see what we got going on here. Sometimes I wish I didn't have such a good ear. for a good guitar related book to read there's a autobiography of Bruce Welch the rhythm guitar player from the shadows and Cliff Richard in the shadows he tells the whole story of how they got the first Fender Stratocaster ever to come to Great Britain for his bandmate Hank Marvin great read great historical thing the reason I bring it up he actually developed, he meaning Bruce Welch, uh, developed a condition whereby he had to have someone else tune his guitar. He would come on stage, play his parts, and never check his tuning, and then walk back off because he became obsessed with the fact that he could never get his guitar perfectly in tune. He could spend hours trying. Um, sometimes I worry that I'm headed for that direction. So let's see. This is a D. Let me leave this off. Yeah, this has to be in just the right spot to get enough travel. Um, I guess with some practice, you'd get a you get the hang of it. Um, so if I'm doing like that, the biggest problem I see with this particular system is the simple fact that I normally lay my hand back here on the bridge. So I can't 
even if I move this over, it's still in my way of my normal picking position. Um, so I'd have to pick up here, change legs. Strum up on the neck. Some tell me I didn't stretch these strings all that well after I put them on in the first place. So what I want to do is think of my lick with my B string two frets lower than what I'm accustomed to playing. So in the case of this compound bend lick, I want to be able to bend the B against the bent G. I actually have to fret it here. Interesting. I'm definitely going to take a little practice to get used to this sort of thing. But clearly, it works. And it's one of the least expensive B bender situations I've encountered. Uh, this was like a hundred bucks. I've seen a lot for a whole lot more money. So you can make a D, you actually make a D7 shape and it becomes a D. I got a button undone. By the way, you like my cat shirt? Get for my wife. Um, yeah, it's there. you don't have to go all the way to the to the board so to speak anyway you can also do something like here make a, a C without the top note and bend into it you have to do it by feel now this can be set to only do a half step bend if for some reason that was something you wanted to do I should also mention, this doesn't have to be a B bender. Uh, this could just as easily be a G bender. And theoretically, you can mount more than one of these to a guitar, but I'll be damned if I know how you would use them independently. I mean, you can mash down on both of them at once and bend both your B and G string, I suppose, if you had two of them mounted like that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit finicky, but hey, I enjoy it. I like it. I think I'll have a lot of fun with this. Uh, at some point in the future, once I've spent some real time practicing with it, I'll demonstrate it again since this was a pretty terrible demonstration. But, uh, but yeah, take a look there. Um, there it is installed. I still have no idea what they were talking about, a, a rubber fitting of some sort. I, I don't see one, nor do I see one in the diagram. But, uh, yeah, it does what it says on the tin. cool if you ask me. Uh, again, it will change your playing position unless you're a guy that already strums on the neck a la Johnny Cash. By the way, for the sake of someone's going to ask about it.
uh, that's what the EQ set flat. I mean, dial in the way I would probably have it. So we got clean crunch, which I was just using, and brown, which is the high gain. <laughs> high gain and telecasters aren't really, you know, at least not single gain. Hello? It's a little microphone, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, this guy would definitely get in the way of my regular playing. So this wouldn't be your daily driver anyway, I shouldn't think, but it'd definitely require some adjustments. Uh, at least three traveling wheelberries just rolled over in their graves. Sorry about that, guys. All right, so uh, we're going to call this a qualified success, meaning a success with an asterisk. Uh, it was aided by steroids. Um, what? Um, yeah. I, I gave it my seal of approval. If you want to uh, want to have a B-Bender guitar around and don't want to spend a whole lot of money, Installation was relatively simple. They include most of the tools that you'll need. I will include a link below to the company, which, as I said, is officially well, Relap Z is the name of the product. The name of the company is CB Giddy Crafter Supply. And uh, this is actually intended, and the reason it's called a Relap Z, Relapse Z. It was intended originally to be used on uh, cigar box guitars. But it just so happens that it works really well on your standard six saddle Telecaster type bridge as well. So, there it is folks. Um, what else would I say? Oh, since we're nearly 900 subscribers, if you're watching this and you haven't subscribed, do us all a favor. Subscribe below, click the bell to get notifications. Feel free to share this video, uh, comment below about anything, you know, if it's just to call me out on what a worthless individual I am for owning a Chipson, that's fine. If it's to talk about something else you'd like to see on the show, uh, which some people no doubt will say more Chipsons, uh, it takes all kinds, folks. There are no, are no, there is no, there is no one type of guitarist guitar enthusiasts, people of every stripe and description. So yeah, do all those things, comment. You can email me, rickenbackeranonymous at gmail.com is still the active email for my account for this channel. You see a Boss Katana Mini practice amp for $20 near you, buy the damn thing. In fact, if you see one for $50 or less, buy the damn thing. Uh, totally worth it. This was not <clears throat> a great demonstration if I had one of my other guitars with, you know, properly struck strings and everything where I could actually play where I'm used to, just take my word for it. This thing is badass. I'm real, real happy with it. Not that I needed another battery-powered desktop amp, but for 20 bucks, I could hardly say no. I've spent more than that on a dinner at Taco Bell because my wife doesn't order off the value menu like I do. Uh, and that's okay. I'm not one to judge. So until you see me next time, uh, be good to yourself and others. Stay cool, stay frosty. You know, just kind of keep on keeping on, right? Just stay with it. And uh, most importantly, whether you have a B-Bender or not, play your damn guitar. That might be you now. I'll check that. So until next time, Steve out. Thank you.